All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed. Welcome to one more show. Working together. My apologies. It looks like my computer or internet went down for a second. I will edit this out afterwards. We are live here. I'm going to restart. So today we are going to have a very short and succinct discussion about antioxidants and which antioxidants to be used in partnership. And why do we use antioxidants when we have inflammatory state, especially chronic inflammatory state, for example, suffering with diabetes or suffering with renal failures or pains and aches, musculoskeletal issues, there could be underlying chronic inflammation that is going on. And in these conditions, of course, the cause of the chronic inflammation must be resolved. But at the same time, inflammation itself should be tamed as well. Otherwise, it causes tissue damage. So let's look at these partners, molecules for antioxidant, because oxidation or reactive oxygen species and reactive lipid species are an important aspect of inflammation that causes tissue damage. So um, take a screenshot of this uh, one diagram because it is going to be very useful throughout the remaining lectures plus for your own need. So in this diagram now, if you have taken your screenshot, the, there is this nucleus here. This is just an illustration of a cell. There is a nucleus in the center. Around the nucleus, there are uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Then around that, there are uh, various mitochondria. Then there are Golgi apparatuses and other organelle of the uh, cell present in the cell as well. I deliberately did not draw them so that I don't clutter up the system, the diagram. In this diagram, I made this cell membrane over here, which is a lipid environment. It's a fatty environment. Inside the cell membrane, we have lipids and the cell membrane sides are made up of phosphate. So this is called a phospholipid bilayer, meaning a sandwich of lipids around with the phosphates. The reason for the lipids to be present here is that the cell wants to maintain its unique internal environment, which is very different from the external environment. So cell does not want anything to just come in or it does not want anything from inside to just leave. So for that, it has created this membrane, a plastic membrane, if you will, that is this lipid or fatty tissue. Not tissue, but fatty molecules. Inside the cell is the cytosol, that is a jelly-like substance over here, which is water-soluble or water-based environment. Then these organelle that I made, these organelle themselves are wrapped into small plastic membranes as well, or fatty membranes too, and they also have lipids in them. And then they maintain their own internal environments. Correct? So with this in mind, that there is a large area which is water-soluble, and then there are parts of the cell that are lipid-soluble. Now what happens is that when we have an inflammatory state, and let's say that we are producing reactive oxygen species, and I will not handle the idea of the reactive oxygen species here. If you say, I will come back live after this talk and we'll discuss reactive oxygen species and reactive lipid species. But just at this time, this much is sufficient that as the mitochondria are functioning and as other metabolic pathways within the cell are running, there are reactive oxygen species that are produced. These reactive oxygen species are very dangerous because what they do is they attack enzymes in the environment and they attack other molecules in the environment and they damage them. And those damaged enzymes and molecules then disrupt the cellular function and the cell becomes stressed out and the in inflammation starts. A more dangerous situation is that when these reactive oxygen species, imagine that these are like bullets, when they enter the lipid areas, fatty areas, they would damage or oxidize, as we say, they would damage a lipid molecule. And interesting thing is that once you damage a lipid molecule, that molecule would then damage another and then those two will damage others and so on. So there is a chain reaction of inflammation or damage that would start within the cell membrane and it would just continue to destroy and damage the lipids around it. So you can imagine that reactive oxygen species 
is actually lesser harmful compared to the chain reaction of reactive lipid species. And this also then makes very uh, critically important that we have to get ahead of this inflammation, otherwise cell and the cell organelle would start getting damaged. So here is the point, the important point of this talk. When you administer antioxidants to take care of these reactive species, we have to administer water-soluble antioxidants. For example, if you see here on this side of the diagram, aqueous or water environment, vitamin C, for example, is an antioxidant and it is water-soluble. Vitamin C will enter the cell in its aqueous environment and take care of the oxidations that are going on and reactive oxygen species that are going on inside the, the aqueous areas of the cell. So that is all good, very good. It will take care of reactive oxygen species. Glutathione is another that would take care of reactive oxygen species within the aqueous environment. Then quercetin is another that is an antioxidant for aqueous environment, watery environment, water-soluble molecules that are damaged and reactive oxygen species that are running around in the watery environment. That is where these would act. Now here I have one that is in green, that is alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid is interesting because it can actually take care of the reactive oxygen species inside the water environment and it can take care of lipid species inside the lipid environment. It works in both environments. But let's leave that for a second. Look on this side now. This is the lipid area, the fatty area of the cell. In the fatty area, we need antioxidants that can enter the fatty area and work. Vitamin C is not allowed in this fatty area because vitamin C is water soluble. So we need fat soluble or lipid soluble antioxidants to go in there and fight a war of reducing the inflammation. So what are these? Vitamin E. Remember this uh, phrase, cat is on the attic. We used to do that in our medical school, A-D-E-K, ADEK, not ATIC. So A-D-E-K are the lipid soluble, soluble vitamins. So here, vitamin E is an antioxidant, plus it is lipid soluble. That can get into the membranes and wherever the membranes or lipid environments are, it can get in there and help reduce or break the cycle of lipid peroxidation or lipid species which create a chain reaction. Imagine that chain reaction if you have those fireworks that are attached to a string and you burn one of them and then all of them start cracking up, right? Or <laughs> burning up. Similarly, coenzyme Q10 or Q CoQ10 is a lipid soluble antioxidant. It is especially very good for the mitochondrial environment, but this can go to wherever the lipid soluble uh, or lipid environments are and help with the antioxidation. Similarly, vitamin A can act as an antioxidant, but within the lipid environment. So now there is a, there are a couple of these molecules and there are actually more. I just took some examples so I can start you thinking in this direction. Alpha lipoic acid and melatonin are antioxidants in addition to their other functions and they can work in water environment and they can work in lipid environment, both. So this means then that if you are looking to curtail inflammation and you suspect or your doctor suspects that there are reactive oxygen species and lipid species that are being produced and there is a chronic inflammation going on and you think that I should take antioxidants or your doctor suggests that, you have to take a combination of water-soluble antioxidants and lipid-soluble antioxidants. That means if you just take, for example, vitamin C, you can't say that I am sufficiently good now because I've taken antioxidant. This is why sometimes people take vitamin C and they say, I'm not feeling as well. The reason for that is that if there is lipid peroxidation going on, if there are re lipid-reactive species formed, and they are doing their own chain reaction, then vitamin C cannot handle that. Vitamin C will need a partner like vitamin E to go and do that. So I hope that this one concept is clear. And if it is clear, I'm going to go to the next diagram and explain these partners that how do they work. So this, again, if you have not taken a screenshot, please take a screenshot. Here the message is, whenever you are taking antioxidants, take water-soluble 
plus lipid soluble or whenever you're discussing it with your doctor or if you are a doctor or a provider and you're doing it for your patient. So with this, I'm going to go to the next diagram. Very simple diagram. So partners in healing. So this is again the cell's membrane. I just took a piece of that membrane. This is a lipid environment. In this lipid environment, I just took one molecule, vitamin E, that would enter this environment and would break the cycle of oxidation or lipid oxidation and resulting damage here. Do you know how vitamin E will do this? So what vitamin E will do is that it would go to a lipid that is oxidized lipid that is reactive and it would pick up the hydrogen from that. It would pick up the that energy, that extra destabilizing force and it would remove it. When the vitamin E will remove that, that lipid will become healed, but now the vitamin E is damaged. Vitamin E will then come near the cell membrane. Remember, it is a lipid-soluble particle, so it cannot just get into the cytosol of the cell because that is water. So it would actually come near the cell membrane. Imagine it is coming to the door, and then vitamin C has to be standing outside to quickly go to vitamin E and take its electron and heal it, oxidize the vitamin E back towards normal and heal that. Sorry, not oxidize, rather vitamin C will become oxidized and vitamin E will be restored to its normal structure. Then vitamin E will once again go and start healing other lipids. So you can imagine that if you just give vitamin E and that vitamin E goes and heals a few lipid molecules, then itself it itself is damaged and now we need to cure this vitamin E. And for that, we need something that is water soluble that is waiting for it to take care of it. Now, when the vitamin C itself is oxidized because it has taken the pain of vitamin E, then vitamin C needs to be regenerated as well. And glutathione does that. The alpha lipoic acid does that. So this is how multiple antioxidants, they partner together to in turn heal each other and keep the antioxidant action going. If you are just administering one and not providing the partners, then imagine that that action will not continue for a longer time. The best example in this one is vitamin C and vitamin E. They should always be partners together. Of course, vitamin C is water-soluble, so it is not stored in our body. Vitamin E is lipid-soluble. It can be stored as well. And you can look at the daily RDAs for that, and you can decide how to take vitamin C or E. But it is possible that sometimes you take vitamin C and you do not see as much of a good outcome, or sometimes you take vitamin E and there is not as good outcome. And the reason is there are they are not partnering together to work to number one, heal the watery side of the environment and the lipid side of the environment and then heal each other. So, uh, Gary Vieira, Vieira, Vieira says, how about NAC? So, NAC is very good molecule because it does many things other than antioxidation. So, one of the function of the NAC is to act as an antioxidant. So, that is good. Second is that NAC gives rise to glutathione. So whenever, for example, when there is uh, Tylenol toxicity and the liver damage is happening, instead of giving glutathione, unless we give IV glutathione, we actually give NSE because NSE is easily absorbed and its bioavailability is better. And NSE is then converted to glutathione and or metabolized to glutathione and then glutathione does its function. NSE has other functions as well. For example, it is mucolytic and for example, it can help with COPD and others. But Kerry, good question. NAC can be used as well instead of glutathione and direct glutathione usage through the oral route has a very poor bioavailability until it is liposomal glutathione or until the, the glutathione is administered through IV route, for example. So glutathione replenishment is better done with NAC. So does this make sense? That we have to have a lipid-soluble antioxidant and a water-soluble antioxidant. With this, today's talk is done, uh, which I wanted to just quickly bring it to you 
that please always use a pair of antioxidants, one from the water soluble category and one from the lipid soluble category so that they can heal each other. Plus they can go to the corresponding departments or parts of the cells and work there. Now my question to you is, and I'll look at the answers here in the comments, would you like to understand how reactive oxygen species are produced, how lipid uh, uh, reactive species are produced and what is that mechanism? If not, that is totally fine. If yes, then I'll stop this live, start another live and we'll discuss that. I just wanted to make sure that this package, this small talk, it, it is very important when you're talking about how to take antioxidants. So with this, thank you very much. Like, subscribe and share. There are links in the description if you would like to support this work and then you can become a member of patrons or Dr. Bean as well. Thank you. And I look at your comment to see, should we go into the mechanism or do that at another time? Bye for now.